<laughs> look at her go. Uh, <laughs> look at her go. <laughs> Bam. Oh, shit. What? What? Oh. Yo. Hey, can you do something for me? Yeah, yeah, what's up? Do what? I'm, like, doing something super Make important. Make a video right now. on a subject. I, I wrote a script. Yeah, but I'm, like, really busy right now. Like, what kind of... Yes or no, can you do it? Yeah, I guess. Like, okay, but you, so you want me awesome. like make a you want me like make a script for you or? No, no, I wrote a script on a thing. You just have to say it. Oh no! I, you put your own spin on it, but you know. No, but Blade, you're what? you're not funny. I don't write comedy videos. What yeah, but like that's not me? the point. You need to like What's add a point? little pizzazz to it. Yeah, so you go twist it, misread it like you do every sentence, and then it's fine. That's yeah? it. Yeah. Okay. Alright, Blade's stupid fucking script. Let's fucking do it. In Hunter x Hunter, each of the main characters is supposed to be a critique on conventional hero tropes, showing how common traits we use to identify good people actually mean the opposite. All three of the main characters given focus as protagonists are given satires of different ways society mistakes destructive behaviors for signs of goodness. And to make this point, the story keeps highlighting that none of them are really good people. At the beginning of the show, Gon is portrayed as the generic shonen main character with rock solid virtuous ideals, but will do a complete 180 when his mentor dies. Killua is portrayed as the edgy side character that kills when necessary, but still has good intentions at the end of the day. And Leorio, I, I don't know, we can relate him to the heroine of the story, I guess. But as the story progresses, you start to see the darker side of their personalities, tendencies, and why their characters seem so off. Gon represents how people often mistake continuous ignorance for ethical innocence or purity, when it's really just negligence. Having him be reckless, dangerous, and unpredictable, and showing how someone dumb and seemingly controllable can be accepted for having zero conventional adherence to morals, whereas a thoughtful person doing the same thing is treated as the biggest villain. Then when Gon eventually did explode from this problematic character trait, it required the release of a calamity level power onto the world and suffering from everyone involved to save him, and then he went right back to the same exact way that he was, that led to that breakdown. Up next is Kilua. Kilua represents how self-centered people can get away from doing bad things by moving the attention to their problems and suffering, only quitting the assassin business because he didn't like it, being open to kill others whenever he wanted to, taking lives as an afterthought so he could concentrate on his own character struggles, and eventually leading to the deaths of hundreds of people he knew his brother would kill during their family feud because he would feel bad if he used his trump card to win early. The only exception is our cutie patootie Leorio, because by contrast, he's supposed to be a character whose traits on the surface makes him seem kind of scummy, but who has a genuine heart. And since he doesn't have a self-contradicting inner character flaw that would turn him into some sort of cautionary tale, that's why the story has never made him a protagonist like the other two. Now you might have noticed I left out a certain revenge-filled, androgynous looking character from the list, and it's because they're the most interesting to me. In my opinion, Kurapika represents how people can arbitrarily decide values and then feel justified hurting others to conform to them, while refusing to reflect on any actual basis on doing so. How judgmental or resentful people can drag others down with them through a perpetual tantrum, enabling themselves to be worse than the people they're mad at in every way they care about, while continuing to see themselves as victims in the form of his constant seek for revenge. Hunter x Hunter doesn't have to define what good and bad are, and a lot of people have different definitions. But the point with these characters is that it doesn't have to. Because for Gon, Kilowa, and Kurapika, all of their heroism tropes inherently contradict notions of them being good people. And to further justify this, I wanted to focus on Kurapika, both as a character and why he really isn't a good person at his core. First, let's go over Kurapika's motivation. While it is seen at first as a virtuous and heroic act to get revenge on the group that killed your clan and family, like um, <clears throat> most revenge plots do in the first place anyway. However, the way I see it, he wants to hurt a group of people he doesn't know personally because he hurt people he cared about regardless of who's in the wrong. We could find out at any point that the Kuruta leaders were running some unfavorable activities like I don't know, drug trafficking or puppy poaching. With the rest of the clan being hostages to ignorant or negligent accomplices, who would try to defend the people they care about in unexpected attacks while also leaving them unchecked to potentially cause harm to others in the first place. Or, 
we could not. And either way, Kurapika would still be doing the same thing he's doing now. Sure, you can't know everything ahead of time, and everyone has to make some judgement calls, but if you're going to assume the guilt and hunt down of a group you've never met to kill them, you should at least be somewhat prepared for the scenario where you'll have to open your perspective to any of the plausible realities where there's at least some amount of context you're missing. From the start, Kurapika is shown to be stubborn, where he'd arbitrarily decide some fact or value about life, argue and even be rude to other people because of it, and then refuse to back down on his actions, even getting mad at signs of other people hoping for him to reconsider so he never has to. His whole personality is built on his refusal to budge on certain convictions. Where that can be considered virtuous and just, if you're willing to drag yourself, your initially unsuspecting targets, and potentially anyone else down with you, with no greater end goal that benefits anyone, that's when it starts to become a problem. And that's exactly where Kurapika is right now as a character. Whether you decide that good generally means motivation or results, small scale actions you're capable of doing in the moment or some bigger picture, Kurapika has no concern for a greater goal that would benefit anyone living. He wants to drag people down with his own hands, and he's willing to involve and ruin unrelated people by doing so. But just like Gonar Killua, the show is able to pass him off as a typically good guy by making the targets of his revenge come across as typical bad guys, and never having his feelings of what's right diverge from his mission, except for one time where it destroyed him. While the trope could turn out to genuinely be the villains they were first portrayed as, Kurapika has shown that from his perspective, he'd willingly put himself in a position that would lead him to do the same thing to innocence, because his motivation is in the wrong place. Grow carrot. Grow carrot. Grow carrot. We're farming. Let's mine. Grow carrot. Next, let's go over his priorities. Whereas someone might put themselves through hardship for some positive change or end goal, or you could argue they might do some bad things for the greater good, Kurapika doesn't have anything like that. He specifically cares about making one group of people suffer, and the remains of a group of dead people untouchable. Nobody living benefits from what he does, and nobody dead really does either. He doesn't care about the state of the world afterward, however Kurapika himself irreversibly sacrifices a lot in the process. So it's not for his well-being. Those people he kills are worse off, and anyone living that can benefit from those dead bodies in whatever convoluted ways are no longer able to. If he'll sacrifice his own future so that the other people also suffer, the only interpretation of good that could work for Kurapika would be the one that only values results, instead of anyone's intentions. But in this case, we've only seen him target people who, despite enjoying bad things, only go down their specific paths to make positive large-scale change. The trope are villains because they have to be to change the world. Hear me, subscribers of Lemoyne. <gasps> um, what the Sigma? My at is Blade of the Grass. In the upcoming video on Kurapika, Lemoyne has referred to the spiders as the Phantom Trope. I will use the power of the Founder to make it seem as though he will have always used the word Troop. So do not worry when you hear him pronounce it incorrectly. It's only because he does not read, yet exclusively watched Hunter x Hunter with subtitles. But I won't let him have his way. Well, thanks for watching. And for an example, Sarainik wants to discover more productive possibilities for the future. Sarainik's reasoning for why he kills people and turns them into art might just be a delusional opportunistic lens to enhance the thrill and empower his narcissism. But what he wants is to create immortal art out of the new conclusions someone intelligent might reach, when faced with the situation of their upcoming death, like some kind of morbid particle accelerator. Blade, that was a terrible comparison. Read the script. Even as much of a stretch as that is, what he does for it and how few results he could actually produce, it's a motivation specifically chosen to provide more benefits to other people than Kurapika's. So Rydnik produces art from dead bodies, giving them function for people still living, and he wants to make progress for the future. Kurapika, on the other hand, wants to drag people down because of the past, and writes off anyone who tries to get enjoyment out of corpse art as deserving of his vengeance. A common theme that's linked the characters Kurapika has been pitted against is an interest in collecting the remains of other people. He specifically designates people as his enemies for having this interest, 
but there's a difference between making the most out of the left body parts that can't bring their owners back and killing people to make art out of them like Saragnik does. People aren't their bodies, but because it's unpleasant to think about, and people normally don't have this separation, it's common to conflate them as the same thing. Because of this, body part collection has been used by the story to symbolize characters having different ways of thinking, which is why the trait is usually given to the specialist class who, by contrast with Kurapika, were inherently born with tendencies to form their own conventional, unconventional worldviews, thus having their own unpolluted by common sense appreciations for corpse art. The whole idea seems to be that while most of what would be bad about human art would be any bad methods to produce those corpses, the inherent association between a corpse and the person it belongs to shows a rigid way of thinking without with bias that someone might operate on out of convenience but could easily end up in the wrong for being stubborn to change. Kurapika is sent against these characters to highlight how, while he might be seemingly chasing bad people who made this human art, he's never actually made enough of a distinction from the person enjoying the art because he's a bad person who would rather insist on a certain fascination being purely evil and punish everyone involved, refusing to let any sort of transformation find any good in the tragedy that was the loss of a life, and potentially being worse about who is at fault of the creation of the art he's after in the first place, or the lives he ruins, since he's not willing to see the full picture. Yeah, no, this has definitely stomped on um, a couple million of people here. But the fragrance is that... Finally, let's go over his actual methods. Kurapika is willing to use other people, conspire to insert himself into structures of power and other people's lives, and force people into desperate situations you know he would try to lie or antagonize his way out of, but then kill the people who do because he's trigger happy. He's willing to endanger the people he knows or cares about. He can write off anyone associated with criminal activity like the Norkyu as okay to ruin for convenience, and is indifferent to murdering people he considers innocent for his own gain, as he knew Melody likely had the same affiliation with the underworld that he did since they went through the same hiring process. But he was willing to kill her off for the sake of his revenge. For each of Kurapika's faults and justifications, both of his biggest antagonists so far are just better than him. For having the same traits but being better than Kurapika, both with them and aside from them. As in, the Phantom Trope and Sir Ragnik were deliberately designed to share Kurapika's faults, but just be better people despite them. Starting with the trope, they're fine playing the villain. They write off anyone in the underground as okay to ruin for convenience, and they're indifferent to killing anyone they consider innocent for whatever their own gains are. The only differences between them and Kurapika are what their motives are, and the actual actions they performed have been. In terms of their goal, their bigger picture seems to be something that has some contribution to the world, whereas Kurapika never prioritizes the positive impact his actions could have. As for their activity, the Phantom Trope has supposedly murdered people and caused large-scale damage, compared to Kurapika, who has yet to actually act on his principles and has a small portfolio. But first of all, we have never seen the trope actually kill uninvolved civilians yet. They've killed people who were part of York News Underground, or attacked them first. And while we've seen a couple of other bodies that were either from areas close enough to the underground activity that they could have been involved, or were sketchy enough that the generalizations of hostility for convenience were as reasonable as writing off all of the underground as fair game. For all we know, the Cruda Massacre could have a similar explanation. But in either case, the trope has just had more time with the same principles as Kurapika. While the trope has caused damage on a larger scale, they're also dealing with corrupt powers and institutionalized problems that also span larger scales. In York New, for instance, they took out tons of people in the streets, but that's only because the entire area was locked down and inhabited by the underground, rather than actual civilians. There were so many of them. They took their own section of the city, formed a den to exchange billions of Jenny, and all the main characters had to operate and continue their adventures within their illicit system. They're willing to ally with unsavory people like Hisoka and commit destructive or unjust actions for both their convenience and enjoyment. But Kurapika specifically does all those things too, and he doesn't even have a productive goal. It's more that Kurapika uses assumptions of the trope to justify not even having any good qualities himself, being a much worse person overall. And that's like the definition and cause of degenerating and being a degenerate. Then we get to Sarainik, who also has a clearly deliberate mirror to Kurapika. 
As the prince of an influential country, Sirajnik is dangerous, and he's presented as a villain through four ways. First, he likes art made of corpses, which as for reasons mentioned earlier, we can completely ignore as a factor of character alignment since it has nothing to do with a person being good or bad. Second, he likes murdering civilians on his free time to make the art from those corpses. That's a bit more of a problem. Third, he has a skewed and narrow worldview that he uses to justify hurting other people when forced them to conform to it, stubbornly and angrily rejecting changes to it, as if he's entitled to his misjudged ways of seeing things even to the point of killing for it. And fourth, if he ever got to a position of unrestricted power over anyone, he would turn the society under his command into a dystopia to fit his oppressive and malicious worldview. Now, since we've justified reason number one, we could compare the last three with Kurapika. So far in Hunter x Hunter, all the characters operate under few principles in this setting that might not fly in the real world or be considered acceptable to most people. For example, most hunters have their own ambitions and generally engage with concepts like good, bad, and overall morality in respect to their own interests. They're fine doing bad things or sacrificing on smaller scale, but they only care about a greater good with respect to their own mutual goals. You can see how they do this with how they're okay keeping most of society in the dark about a power they know certain criminals use. Because if individual civilians die from these killers, it keeps preserved order overall. And most hunters will see nothing wrong with taking advantage of that power within circles and competitions that involve regular civilians, as long as it gets them towards their goals. The systems of power only work in Hunter x Hunter because the characters in charge of them, whether you consider them good or bad, are willing to sacrifice individual people either directly or indirectly, by just removing their agency and making it so that known hazards can openly kill them, which has the same results, intentions, and actions behind it, but can just be dressed up nicer so the people who allowed it to happen don't have to look or feel as bad. The characters in Hunter x Hunter abide by a similar philosophy, as every Hunter x Hunter we've seen does this to some extent, and Kurapika is a clear example of someone who's willing to sacrifice the lives of others for what they believe is a bigger picture, and their concern for the greater good is only however far it aligns with their own interests. As someone who is a major influential figure in a larger nation, and also an actual functioning pillar in their nation's order, Routinely killing one or two people for his downtime is a sacrifice on the same level. The difference here is that, again, Sirajnik actually has ambitions or at least has the drive to pursue the unknown and the potentially beneficial. He sacrifices less than the other world leaders we've seen. And because of his ambitions, his philosophy is just Kurapika's with more positive traits. Sirajnik's distorted worldview comes from the fact he was sheltered and had a upbringing different from what we would consider standard, free of any mutual experiences and this is because he was a cocky prince. This means he's quick to judge things about facts or states of the world, and assumes the bigger picture based on his own smaller assumptions despite not developing the same common sense or taking in the same information as the other people he disagrees with. He's also quick to write other people off as useless, inferior, or subhuman. This is just like Kurapika, who also has a distorted worldview, stubbornly rejects changes to it, and will write off someone's value as a human by deeming them some kind of monster for arbitrary qualities that just happen to offend him personally. They're both influenced by malice, and feel entitled to being that way because they're rare positions in life. The difference between them here is that throughout this arc where he's been introduced, Sirajnik has confronted changes to his worldview, embraced them openly, and even started developing and reflecting on his own convictions as a result. He's been growing as a person! So for the last quality that the story uses to portray Sirajnik as a villain, the danger he presents if he obtains power. It's a similar case with Kurapika. If Kurapika became the president of the world, he would narrow-mindedly restrict people's autonomy so everyone would conform to his principles, and the result would be similarly dystopian. However, in Sirajnik's journey to obtaining this power, he's been developing as a person, and even though it's twisted, his larger motivation has been for some kind of positive change. It's not like Sirajnik is a good person overall, and I don't think he'll go through a journey like Merrim's, but for every reason Sirajnik or the Phantom Trope would be bad people, Kurapika is far worse. So explain to me why you broke that trust between, between two people, okay? Explain how you broke that trust between two people when you made this, okay? Do you wanna, do, do you care to explain yourself? You can't explain yourself, Rit. It seems like Kurapika is a bad person, who just stays a hero in the story. 
because it keeps denying him opportunities to become a villain, while by contrast, his enemies are the exact opposite, where much more flexible or well-meaning people are just placed into circumstances where they end up being bad guys. Cause for however thoughtful, kind, or well-meaning someone may be, a person only has a finite amount of choices, reaction time, comprehension, for an infinite number of potential scenarios. So, if you end up with cases like Sarainik or Corolio, and with a guy who has an irrational and flimsy worldview who always two steps away from revealing how childish he is, gets to pass himself off as the stoic and responsible pro hunter everyone admires him for being. This is just going to be a personal side bit, but I really hope this arc is where Karapika has to confront his own contradictions. I know it's probably not the route the story will go down for whatever its end goals are, but it'd be so cool if they actually had Karapika turn out to be the one who killed Neon, and show how he'd devolve and his justification would fall apart just by having someone like Tsaridnik haunt him with the remnants of the Kurta in his possession. Karapika's an interesting character, but he's digging himself a grave with his current ambition. By contrast, Tsaridnik has so much interesting potential and can grow to do anything further, and I want to see where he can go. So if we're sticking with Karapika as a living main character, then I'd love if he could go through some transformation and reach a state where he'd be able to explore new ambitions or worldviews, or at least compromise with Tsaridnik at some point, and redirect his unchanging personality towards some different goal, where we could then see Tsaridnik grow through him. One of those two. But, you know, I imagine chances are Tsaridnik's just going to play the role of a villain, or end up dying early. With all the emphasis they're putting into his character, it feels like they're just gonna subvert it all by killing him off pretty early on. Damn! Jesus, get the fuck out of my way. This is my video, bitch. I'm kidding. But anyways, guys, that's the end of the video. As per usual, I'll leave some clips of the audio. This has been an hour long. <laughs> yeah, no, this has definitely stomped on um, a couple million of people here. What fragrance is that? <laughs> this isn't at any point during the day. All right, look at this. Okay. During the night, yeah. <laughs> What the? <laughs> just, you just still made it. <laughs> Watch if I can go on the off beat. <laughs> you already touched me. Please, <laughs> please. Look, see, if they just kissed, they would have been fine. Mark, <laughs> I can't believe you fucking domain expansion me. What the fuck was that? So I had some people. They, if, um, I actually knew boxing or not, okay? All the stories are true. Look at this shit. Look at this shit. Wanna hear something funny? Bang! Okay? Don't question me! I'm never wrong. Never lying.